Welcome to this episode of the Million Dollar Mastermind. I'm Larry Wydell, and before we get started, if you want to know exactly how to win again and again, go to wydellonwinning.com forward slash webinar now to watch something I've put together for you. Now let's get going into this episode of Million Dollar Mastermind. I'm talking with Jeff Robinson. And Jeff is my buddy for a long time, for about 12 years. He's been the owner of a ski locker uh, place in Aspen. He's in his third location. <laughs> and uh, it is, he's in a premier location right downtown, right by the mountain. Owner of the ski shop, Ajax, and uh, revenue over $5 million. It's a luxury locker experience you go in there and you're not schlepping your your skis and boots over to the mountain and changing boots to you know clomp up the hill and get on the gondola you know you're right you're right there all your stuff is toasty you know your boots have the heaters on at night and it's just uh you know plus it's a club environment you know you start off saying hello to your friends and uh uh it's just a great environment. And if you get out to Aspen, you're going to be out there a lot, you know, come by the uh, ski shop. They've got all the best equipment. So hello, Jeff. Hey, Larry. How are you? Great. So the summer been busy? The summer has been busy. It's been, it's been good. It's been a great summer in Aspen. And this is your second ski uh, season in your new location. And, uh, uh, it's worked out better than you expected, don't you think? Yeah, I know. It's a great location uh, as far as foot traffic and visibility and retail. It's just it's a it's a better location than our last store. That's for sure. Um, and about three times the size, too. Yeah. Now, talk, Jeff, about when you started uh, out, uh, you've had other businesses. You came you came for you're in Aspen for quite a while. Uh, now, but uh, you came over from uh, Scottsdale or Phoenix. I came over from Scottsdale, yeah. And my and my background before I got in the ski business was automotive collision repair. So um, I started out with one store back in '93 in in a town called Mesa, Arizona. Then uh, built another store up in North Scottsdale, um, and then acquired another store in Arrowhead, which is kind of over in Glendale. So we had three collision repair body shops doing insurance billable type collision repair. And how did you get into that? Uh, just growing up, I was just kind of a, a car guy, a kind of a gearhead. And, uh, and then one of my buddies was a really good painter body guy that taught me a ton of stuff. And we, uh, I did that going through college and, uh, I got out of college and was working a little bit, studying, studying and for my LSAT because I was going to go back to law school. And this buddy was working at a body shop. He was a, he was a body tech. So he, he was fixing cars and stuff at a shop. And he started talking to me one day and he goes, hey, uh, the, shop, the shop I'm working at's for sale. I go, that's cool. I go, are you going to buy it? What are you going to do? And he goes, no, you, are you interested in buying it with me? And I'm like, and I'm studying for the LSAT and kind of grinding that out. And I go, you know, it sounds kind of fun. It sounds like a little more fun than going to law school. Maybe let's look into that. So we ended up buying our first shop together in 93. And that's kind of how it all started. And uh, uh, why were you going to law school? Well, I thought a wanted, better option. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted to be an attorney. So um, I liked that studying it in college. And I was a I was political science English major at Arizona State. And uh, I just really enjoyed that side of it so you know, i thought that's the, the the road i was going to go down until until we did this and i mean at heart i'm a i'm a, I'm a car guy gearhead loved being around cars and all that stuff so at the time it seemed like the right move and it was i mean i'm glad we did i did that for almost 20 years that i had those 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 stores so um really what did you uh you you've always uh was it, were you set up to go in that direction from high school and growing up? Uh, uh, you know, you say you're a gearhead. What does that mean? <laughs> kind of when I say that, I mean, I just liked working on cars, um, fixing cars. Um, 
and then got into the painting. I was painting my own cars and doing the body work on them and rebuilding the motors and and I was fixing up cars. And then the same partner and I, before we bought that shop, we would go to the auction and we'd buy cars, fix them up and flipping them and sell them and make them make money on it. It's kind of how I put myself through college. So um, I wasn't ever planning on owning a body shop. That wasn't my plan, especially out of college. I was planning on, you know, continuing my education and getting a law degree. So, um, but uh, it took a turn and went down the other direction and uh, I'm happy I did. I, I enjoyed it. And, and, you know, I still miss it a little bit. I love the ski business, but I love being around cars and I love that business. Um, you know, it was challenging sometimes with the insurance companies and whatnot, but uh, it was uh, rewarding giving a customer their car back as good or better than when before it got crashed. You know? Yeah. And the thing is like you, I haven't heard of that concept of putting yourself through college flipping cars rather than flipping i know flipping houses yeah but flipping cars uh i hadn't heard that one yeah that's it worked and uh in a typical type thing what what could you do you know you're 20 years removed from it now so it doesn't not giving away trade secrets but uh it must have been fairly profitable yeah, I mean, uh, every car was different. Sometimes you'd buy a car at the auction, you didn't think it was hit as hard as it was, and you'd run into other other problems and need more parts. So that job, then, that one may not be as profitable. But, you know, usually, uh, I don't want to say you could double your money, but you could you could, uh, you could could make a couple grand on a car by buying it, fixing it up, and selling it. And, you know, and it was a month or two long process because you had to do all the title work and all that stuff and then fix it and then put it on the market and find somebody to buy it. Um, so it was, you know, it was, a, it was a fairly long two, three month process per car, but, um, but it was a good investment. We'd stick our money in it and, and go through the process, sell it, make some money. And, and, uh, well, you learned, you got a taste of being in business for yourself too, and not having a limited income. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And we even, we even leased a little space. We even had a little shop that we worked out of. So, um, it wasn't a full blown body shop, but it had everything that we needed to do the repairs on the cars that we were buying. So when did the idea come to you? I'm going to put myself through college doing this. <laughs> I just, I was either go get a job at a restaurant or something or, or do what I really like to do. And that's, you know, get my hands dirty and work on cars. So I'm like, I'd rather do that in the afternoon after classes than go work at a bar or restaurant at night, trying to make some extra cash to put myself through school. What motivated you, uh, as you were moving up, what did, what were you attracted to other than cars in general, but in life, what, what were you thinking your life would shape up to be, you know, what attracted your attention? Well, I kind of always knew I kind of wanted to do my own thing um, and own my own business and not really, I couldn't imagine myself really working for somebody. I was always had the kind of that entrepreneur itch. So um, it just kind of happened over time. Um, and then once I got into my first store, I really knew that was the direction I wanted to go and kind of expand and expand into a different area up. And when I did my second store, we built it. It was in a higher end area. I enjoyed working on higher end cars and that was a little more affluent area. So we were working on, you know, BMWs and Mercedes and Porsches and stuff like that, rather than my other shop where we were working on a little lower end car, even though the process is exactly the same and you got to do exactly the same thing to every car. I just enjoyed being around some of those higher end cars and uh, clientele. And any kind of experience you went through early on that told you you didn't want to grow up working for, what gave you the, the signal on the highway that I don't want to be working for somebody else uh, all my life? It's always <laughs> interesting how that signal comes to us. You know, it comes to some people and some people that signal, it never occurs to them that they could actually get through life and not have to work for someone else. Yeah. You, you know, I, I think a big part of it was I really admired my grandfather and uh, he always owned his own business and he was really successful and he ran his own business and, uh, you know, had a lot of flexibility, even though he worked really, really hard. I think it was being around him and working with him growing up and doing things and doing projects with him that kind of, I just kind of saw that and go like, I kind of think that's what I kind of want to do too. So that might have been kind of the light that I saw way back when, when I was young. What was the hard thing about being in business 
for yourself? I mean, what was, uh, did you have to kind of develop some new skills or reorganize your, your, your thinking or make some adjustments to, to be successful in that thing? No, I wasn't afraid to work hard um, and put the time in and do whatever it takes to be successful. You know, um, some of the some of the challenges are employees. Uh, sometimes it could be cash flow, figuring those things out, growing and and having the, the capital to grow. Um, those were some challenges. But, you know, I, I when I started doing it, I decided I was going to do it and I was going to work hard and do whatever it takes to be successful. And uh, not everybody gets to that, ever actually makes that decision, do they? <laughs> no. Uh, but it seems like, you know, it's like this business is hard. You know, life is hard. And it's like, you know, how do you do it? It's just so hard. It's like, well, it'd be hard for me, too, if I did it the half butted way that you do it, you know? Right. Uh, trying to cut corners and making everything 10 times harder than it needs to be. When you make up your mind to just go do it, it, it starts to get a lot simpler, doesn't it? It does. For sure. I've heard that phrase, do whatever it takes to be successful. Uh, did you uh, actually have that thought in your mind or is that just kind of a description is like you know the confidence that you could get a lot of a lot of people will stall out jeff because they say well i don't know this i don't know that i don't have you know like funding you know like how do you go get funding you know this and the other and uh, all the answers are out there people have figured it out but uh they don't get past the point of understanding whatever it is you don't know uh somebody else out there does know and what you just because you are ignorant today on a particular subject or you don't know how to do something today doesn't mean that tomorrow you couldn't you couldn't have it all figured out because someone showed you how you know no. and yeah. uh how did you figure your way through a lot of those early stages Hey, listen, there's a lot of information online, but there aren't a lot of people who have actually done something. In my case, I've actually built a successful business that's accrued over $5 billion in assets under management and has done well even during trying times. Now, if you want to know exactly how I've done this, go to whiteellenwinning.com forward slash webinar now. I've compressed a decade of learning into five short weeks just for those of you who want to give yourself an incredible advantage and are tired of waiting and watching others move up. Well, I, I remember starting in 93. Fortunately, my partner had a good background in the business. So uh, he was kind of my mentor and, and we worked together um, for the first couple of years. But going into it, I knew absolutely about zero about billing an insurance company and how the whole process worked with the insurance company owning a full retail style body shop. So uh, to be honest with you, I just kind of wrote his coattails. He taught me everything I know. Um, and I learned everything from him. And, but within a year, I knew everything and how it all worked. So it wasn't, it didn't take me 10 years to figure it out. We, I figured it out pretty quick, but I was lucky that I had a mentor and a partner that, that, that knew what he was doing, although he was learning some things too at the same time. He had never been at that level, but he had the background and had been around it enough to know that, that we could do it and be successful at it. Uh, and how did you, uh, what triggered the, was it just natural evolution? Let's get this, expand here, expand there, just opportunities came and you jumped on it? Yeah, as, as we grew and figured out and the shops became successful, I, I, I guess maybe it's time to do another one and then had the opportunity to acquire another one uh, that just kind of came about. So um, it was just kind of time and the timing and uh, economy doing well. Uh, did it turn out the way you expected? Yeah, it sure did. In terms of income and, and uh, opportunities and things like that. It did. It did. Yeah. I mean, it provided a, a really good lifestyle for me for a long time, um, having that career. And what, what does that mean? A really good lifestyle? 
just uh, an income and, and, and the life that I had, you know, um, I was married, had, had three kids and they had, they had a great lifestyle and, and, um, uh, it was just, uh, it was, it was, it was a successful time. Now, what caused, uh, what got you excited about, when did Aspen come on your radar? Was that your first, uh, experience with a, uh, you know, a ski town? Uh, well, I grew up skiing, but yeah, living in a ski town. So, so I got out of the, the I, I sold the body shops, um, in 2008 and just took a little time off. And then, um, I was skiing in Aspen, um, had just gone through divorce, skiing in Aspen with my girlfriend, and we were just talking to people, and we were having a great time here for a week, and everybody's telling us how great the summer is, and we're like, okay, I'm sure it is, I'm sure it's beautiful, and I'd never been here in the summer, so we were just driving home back to, back to Scottsdale, and we go, you know, maybe we should just rent a place for a couple months and just come spend a couple months in, in Aspen and see what it's really like, hike and do all those fun things that you do in Aspen and ride your bike around and enjoy the great weather. So we rented a place for a year rather than three months, just because it was more cost effective because it was going to be so expensive to rent a place for two or three months here. So rent a place for a year, uh, skied, had a good time. And that's when I had, uh, when I started getting to know the ski town, the ski business a little bit, had a locker over there with you. This was before I owned the shop and uh, rented a locker from Alex yeah, and to get, Alex, and to get to know the ski business. Yeah. And uh, anyway, renewed the lease, stayed another year, bought the ski shop. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything and, and I saw potential in the shop and, and, uh, and the guy that owned it wanted to get out. So I'm like, you know, uh, I'm not really doing anything right now. I see the potential in your business model with the locker room slash ski shop slash tune shop. And I go, I, I think it's got huge potential. He wanted to get out and I saw, I decided to buy it from him. And it's, uh, that was back in 2010. So um, this will be our 11th season with the store. So it just kind of, uh, that's, that was my first taste of it being, being in Alex's shop that I ended up buying from him when I met you. And uh, that was uh, 11, 11, 12 years ago. Now, a lot of, the, a lot of being in business is figuring things out. You know, when people listen to these podcasts, they're, they're wanting to, you know, they're listening for what did you do? How do you do it? You know, I'm, you know, you're in a state of confusion, but some, a lot of these things unravel themselves pretty quickly. Like, as you said, uh, you can go from an industry, a business where you know absolutely nothing about it, but you know, you have an interest, you're not afraid of working. And uh, if you just pay attention and uh, you don't have to be taught everything over and over again. In a year, you can become a master of the game. You know, it, most things are like that. In fact, I found that you can get pretty good at just about anything in 90 days if you get saturate yourself with it, but especially in a year. And so uh, uh, just having that approach, a professional type approach, we're not going to have this as a hobby thing. This is going to be... Uh, a business, you know, we're yeah. going to, we're, we're going to treat it like a business. We're going to expect a business income, a business result and uh, dependability and profitability and all of that. Having that mentality, looking at opportunities gives you an incredible advantage over the people who just see it as, well, we got a store and we do this that, and the other and kind of take what comes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky enough when I when I acquired the store, I inherited a couple really good employees that had really vast knowledge of the ski business that had been doing it a long time, you know, and one of them really taught me a lot that I know today, uh, technical and, and tech, the technical side of the business and stuff. And I, to be honest with you, Larry, going into the ski business was kind of like when I went to the body shop business, I knew a little bit about it and it was a business and I knew I could figure it out. But I really didn't know that much about buying hard goods and what I should buy and and difference between the boots and the sizes and all the different things and and the construction of skis and and should we do clothing in this little store that we got, which we tried, which was kind of a failure. We should have never tried to do clothing. There just wasn't enough room. We should have just spoke. So it took me a couple, two, three years to really dial in what our niche was and to get the thing profitable to get the locker room full to get 
people to know where we were because we were on the backside of a building. People didn't, if you didn't know where we were, you know, you, you had a tough time finding us. But it, so it took a couple, a couple years to figure it out um, because it is seasonal. So listen, you got five months to kind of do your thing and then you've got this time off and then you do, and then your, your next year comes around. So it's not like you're doing it year round even. I mean, you're still running your business year round, but you're really in there dealing with people for those five months of the ski season. So um, after about two there in our third year, we filled the locker room completely full, acquired another space, did another locker room, and then filled that one and had a waiting list with very little turnover. Um, got a really good reputation of the ski tuning. I had, you know, obviously some great guys tuning for me that knew what they're doing. We had a great reputation there and really got a very small space rocking and rolling. As you know, you've been in that space and you know it was pretty pretty tight, but we 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 did a lot in that space and it became really successful. Yeah. And uh there's when you there's there's a there's actually some advantages to having a small space because uh it causes you to be cost effective or make sure well first of all nobody can lay around there was only you know Steve was going to take care of whatever chair was in there. So <laughs> you couldn't come in and sit down because Steve was going to be in there. Right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. There was only about four seats in the whole place. To Yeah. So uh, if anybody was in there, they're going to be working. Yeah. And then uh, it was real obvious. You look around if this merchandise is not moving, it, it wasn't going to escape your notice, you know, it's like, yeah. why, do, why are we giving that much space to that kind of merchandise? Nobody ever asked for it. Nobody never sell it and get it out of there and get something else in there. Exactly. And uh, there's some real advantages to small spaces, especially when you're learning, especially when you're getting started. That's for sure. Yeah. Everything in that shop had a place. And I mean, everything and it had to be put back right where it was at. We had to be really efficient there. We couldn't have a lot of clutter and mess and things needed to go back right where they came from. Every boot had a certain spot that it went to every ski, all the rental equipment went into a certain spot. So we, we had a lot of stuff inside of that, that 1100 square feet going on, but you're right, you know, advantage wise, it makes you be efficient. Obviously you're keeping your rent factor down, which is huge, especially in a town like Aspen. Um, well, the thing about that, you know, even like J. Paul Getty said, the thing about keeping your expenses down, he said the, I think he called it the, uh, what did he call it? The, uh, the tight wad or the guy, the guy who is uh, tight fisted on his expenses. He said, the advantage the guy has is that he's got more margin for error. You know, when things go wrong or cash flow goes down, he can take the bumps a lot better than the guys living on the edge. Yeah. And, uh, uh, this, you know, you just learn how to be efficient. And, uh, but so much of the time when we're small, everybody who's small is just inside them thinking about how can we get bigger? How can we get bigger? How can, you know, more space? And that, depending on the time, uh, unless you've maxed out where you are, uh, that's not really what you need to do necessarily. No. Not at all. I mean, we that little shop was doing really, really well when um, when I was approached because somebody wanted, needed, and wanted my space to expand. Um, I wasn't planning on selling or moving or anything like that until I was approached, and then um, I was offered the right amount of money and, and and found the space across the street, which was a better space. I'm like, you know, I'll move over there. There again, it was going to be three times the size, a lot more rent, but I. Uh, I knew that we could make it work and, and uh, be successful over there too. And it, it's been a fun move. It's been fun changing the way we've done things. We've got more room, different equipment, a brand new locker room. Um, it, it's, a, it's been a fun process. But setting up a new store is always going to be more work than you anticipate, isn't it? Because I noticed like last year as you moved into that new thing, you'd already moved once. And then you move again. It just uh -huh. seems like, I mean, you guys is just on and on and on, <laughs> you know. It seems uh -huh. like the last, last few years of my life has been moving, but 
Um, yeah. I mean, try, you know, because you were, you know, the, the second location where you were last year was right across the street from my condo. And it's right. like, you know, that <laughs> truck was out there unloading and loading all the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, fortunately, we knew that was a temporary pop-up spot because we had to wait for the lease on the new space before we could gut that thing and do a full remodel on it. So that was just kind of a temporary, almost kind of a, a season off for us, but we didn't want to lose our momentum as a ski shop and a locker room. We wanted to have a presence. So we did a small amount of hard goods. We didn't do any tuning that year. We had a small locker room just to keep lockers for our current locker members if they wanted one and just wanted to have a presence in town that we, we hadn't gone away. The shop wasn't gone. And that we were, and so we could also promote the new store, the new locker room, and what we were doing in the new space. So that was a lot of work <clears throat> moving in there, and then, and then obviously, the design, the build, the, the, you know, we demoed the thing and did all the construction, trying to get it done for ski season, having problems with delays, and not, you know, last, last the last couple of years have been tough, and getting guys to finish the job and stuff, but we got it done. I mean, we were working all the way up to Christmas, finishing things into the holiday season, but we got it done um, with a lot of work from a lot of guys. And I can tell you that this year, right now, it's going a lot smoother than last year. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's one thing those listening, you know, if you're starting a business right now, next year is going to be smoother folks. You know, uh, you don't, you know, when you start, you don't know what you don't know, and you're in the process of learning what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and every situation or in every location has its own little group of uh, factors that you have to work through. But the second time around, then you can, you know, you're through the initial orientation and you can start to refine and improve and build momentum which is what you're doing now. And what I'd like to say, Jeff, is congratulations on making three locations a success and really growing and uh, set a, uh, uh, you know, a spirit of growth and positive uh, vibe uh, in all three locations. And that's a credit to uh, your leadership. Thank you, Larry. If you enjoyed what you've heard and are dead serious about finding out for yourself exactly how this works in the real world, I've taken the most valuable business lessons I've learned over 40 years and put them into something for you to watch. Go to whiteellenwinning.com forward slash webinar now in order to move up as fast as possible. I'm Larry Whitell and I run the Million Dollar Mastermind. Go, go, go.